So how are we doing, Andrea? Is it time to begin? There's about 23 attendees. Um, I think we can begin um, and then people could um, come in. You need to trickle in. Yeah. You're 25, that's a good number. Yeah. And then I've already uh, started the recording as well. Oh, good. <laughs> so I've already forgotten that. <laughs> okay, Barbara. Would you like to start? Have to unmute. I want to wish a big welcome to everybody. I hope everybody is doing well and coping with this challenging time. Um, we wish we could have met you in person, um, but hopefully we will meet many of you. Um, when you attend the graduate certificate program. So the purpose of this webinar is to give you information um, about our program. So we're going to tell you a little bit about FIU and about the FIU Herbert Wortham College of Medicine. Then we'll tell you about the GCP program itself. We call the graduate certificate in molecular and biomedical sciences GCP. So that's how we'll be referring it to it. Uh, we'll tell you about our mission and goals, um, our facilities, our curriculum, our faculty, um, things that special things that we have. Among them are our learning scientists and tutors. We'll tell you about our commitment to professionalism and how we are introducing pro professionalism in the curriculum. Um, additional features, we'll tell you about the outcomes of the students who have been through the program um, and then what makes a good applicant and how you can apply for this program. And then we should have plenty of time for question and answers. So just to give you a little orientation um, for Zoom, this is probably maybe not like some of the classes that uh, you might have been attending where everybody's face is showing. Um, we decided to do it in a webinar format, so you can you can see the host. You'll be able to see the panelists, um, and the hosts and panelists will be able to, to speak. But the attendees are, uh, for the time being, muted, and you will be asking questions through the question and answer tool that you should see at the bottom of your screens. I think um, by now, since we've been through at least half a semester. Of, of Zooming, and uh, many of you have been in school during this time, you're probably familiar with, with the features um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, the moderator will ask questions of the hosts and the panelists um, at the end. So if you could, if you have any questions, perhaps you can write them down or you can put them in the Q&A box um, and then the moderator um, will be able to uh, uh, to uh, designate somebody who is the best person to answer your questions because we don't want you leaving here with any questions unanswered. Next. So the host, um, I'm Dr. Barbara Roller. I'm the Administrative Program Director. You will also be hearing from Dr. Tracy Weiler who is the Academic Program Director and Andrea Metamoros, who is our GCP program coordinator and is also the moderator of this webinar. And as you'll see, especially if you come here to FIU, you'll see she's an invaluable coordinator <laughs> to the program. We, we, also, have, we also have panelists who have um, been very excited about, about coming here to talk to you. Um, we have representatives from cohort two, uh, Tom and, Cher and Sarah um, will be available to answer your questions. We have um, students from our cohort three, um, Brian, Lewis, and Caesar. Um, you can see um, these are all students who, who attended the, the graduate certificate program 
um, and are currently in her College of Medicine. Um, oh, I understand that, that Kristen is also here um, from cohort three. And from cohort four, um, we have Venus, we have Alexis, we have Mark, and we have, uh, and we have Brooke. And so um, we're very excited that they're excited that they want to be here to, to share their information about GCP with you. So a little bit about Florida International University. Um, you can see in the, in the map where we're located. Um, you know, when Dr. Weiler put up this map, I said, well, it looks like we're really close to the water. And we actually are um, on a good day without traffic, like now when nobody's on the road. Um, but we are fairly close to Biscayne Bay in, in Miami. Um, the top picture shows a picture of our library, um, the tall building and also the student center, which is the round uh, glass building, the ground center. Um, and actually behind me is the College of Medicine building. I don't know if you can see the words on the top of the building. That says Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. Um, FIU is, was Miami's first and only public research uh, university. It was actually um, it got approval to start in 1965, and it had first students in 1972. It was established on the site of an abandoned airport, and the original class in 1972 was only 5,400 students. And now, as you can see, we have over 58,000 students. In fact, our president um, just told all the faculty that this spring graduation, we had over 6,000 students graduating, which was more than um, the entire school um, when the school first opened. Um, so um, it is the fourth largest public university in the United States. And actually, um, I'm not sure if, it, if we're one or two um, in uh, minority STEM degrees. Um, so we're very, very proud of that. We are a top tier research institution and we're committed to collaborative engagement locally and globally, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about how, how we're doing that. So the Herbert Wertheim uh, College of Medicine. This is actually the site of the building that you're seeing um, in my picture, but that's the site. Those are actually um, solar panels that as you walk, they change color. Um, but that is actually what the College of Medicine building looks like. It's the Academic Health Center, too. Um, uh, the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine was established in 2006, and uh, we enrolled the first medical students in 2009. It was a very exciting thing. I participated in, in the excitement of the creation of the College of Medicine, um, which actually started um, back in trying to get a College of Medicine back in the 1990s. But finally, in 2006, we got approval from the state legislature and the Board of Governors. And we did have our first medical students in 2009. We matriculate 120 medical students per year. And we're very proud of their USMLE scores and of their residency placements. Um, it is a community-based curriculum. It does emphasize the social determinants of health, which um, you know, as you know what's going on, you know that social determinants of health are like, are really, really important for healthcare professionals uh, to be aware of. Um, we, uh, although we started with um, medical students in 2009, in 2012, we started a PhD program in the biomedical sciences. And in 2016, um, we started a um, master excuse me, 2015, we started a master in physician assistant studies program and our PA students are very well received in, in the community. They all, apparently they all have jobs um, when they graduate. Um, we, we then started the graduate certificate in molecular and biomedical sciences the following year in 2016. So we've had four years of this program.
Okay, so the Graduate Certificate in Molecular and Biomedical Sciences is a two semester program um, with eight courses. It is cohort based with face to face learning, little asterisks there, barring a pandemic or a hurricane or some other natural disaster. Um, we do like to see your faces and to be um, engaging with you one on, um, you know, live. Um, there is a small class size. Our, our class is a maximum of 60 students. And we do uh, incorporate active learning strategies into a lot of what we do. And in the photo, you can see um, some of our students using pipe cleaners for uh, mitosis and meiosis uh, as, as an in-class activity. The the GCP mission um, is as follows. We aim to provide academic enhancement and professional development to applicants for health-related professional degree programs, primarily medical school, but other degree programs as well. Um, the program strengthens the biomedical knowledge and professional skills of the applicant and improves their qualifications for application to medical school or other health with related professional degree programs. Our goals are to enhance biomedical knowledge, develop your communication skills, develop professional skills such as learning skills, test taking strategies, time management and goal setting, stress management, and um, having you figure out what your values and beliefs are and how to live by those. Um, we have uh, mandatory advising meetings with, um, with me as uh, academic advising meetings um, with Dr. Roller for medical school admissions counseling. And then we have learning scientist advising meetings as well. And all of this is intended to enhance um, the, the, um, the non-academic and the academics um, of, of of your, of your time here. There are in-house NBME style exams, which are seem very painful when you are within in the program, but by the time you get to medical school, you're chill and this isn't a big deal anymore. And, and everybody's very grateful to have been through, um, through all of these exams. Uh, we do writing and presentation type assessments and so getting up in front of a class seems pretty easy by the time you're done with GCP. Um, there are, as Dr. Roller said, professionalism evaluations that happen four times a year. And this program has a coaching philosophy, both for students and for faculty. So, um, you know, mistakes happen, errors are made, and we just will do better tomorrow than we did today. This is uh, uh, an illustrator, some photos. These are some photos of the rooms in which uh, your classes will be held. These two um, photos on the right are of um, the Academic Health Center 2 building um, room 170. And you can see all of the medical students here and on the top you can see looking down at the, at the podium and the screens at the front. And then this is on the left, you can see Academic Health Center building number four, room 101. And again, one giant screen in this room and tiered seating all the way up to the back. Each of these rooms seats about um, 120 students, 130 students. And there are microphones so that um, you can um, hear what your peers are saying and and um, everything is recorded via a lecture capture system. So let's talk a little bit about the GCP curriculum. Um, there are 20 credit hours in two semesters. Um, there are biomedical science courses and there are professional skills courses. In the fall semester, the three uh, biomedical science courses are medical microbiology and immunology, medical molecular biology, and medical cell biology and biochemistry. And then there is a bio, uh, professional skills in medical sciences course that is a one credit course. 
in the spring semester. Again, three three credit hour courses in biomedical science, pathology and medical histology, medical physiology and medical genetics, followed by a second um, professional skills in medical sciences, one credit hour course. <clears throat> excuse me, this is a very integrated curriculum and um, uh, content is supported from one course to another. Uh, the faculty talk to each other and know what one person is teaching in one course and it comes back again in other courses. And you really get to know how integrated it is when the students say at the end of it, you know, I don't know where I learned that content. I don't know in which course I learned that. All I know is I know it, and I really know it. So the course faculty um, for the fall co bio biomedical science courses, um, the um, cell biology and biochemistry course, Dr. Irina Agulnik is the course director, and she is supported by um, Dr. Masafumi Yoshinaga and Dr. Hitendra Chand, um, who teach um, some of the metabolism sections in that course. Um, then there is the medical microbiology and immunology course. Course director is Dr. Kale Mithi, and she is supported with, um, um, by Dr. Maricela Agudello, Dr. Hosheng Anwala, and Dr. Andrea Raymond, who teach the um, immunology section of that course. And the third course in fall semester is medical molecular biology. Um, I am the course director and I have help from uh, Dr. Melissa Armas, who teaches about a quarter of that course. Then, as I mentioned, there's the professional skills in medical sciences. Um, Dr. Roller teaches that in both fall and spring, it's a one semester or one credit hour course, um, uh, one hour twice a week. In the spring, we have three more biomedical science courses, um, the medical genetics course that I teach, um, the medical physiology course that Dr. Mulek is the course director for and uh, supported by Dr. Sahar Ajabshir, and finally the pathology and medical histology course that is directed and taught by Dr. Eileen Marty. And you might have seen Dr. Marty on the news, uh, on TV, et cetera, et cetera. She has been um, very heavily involved in the COVID-19 um, coronavirus outbreak um, um, planning and, and uh, management of that um, in South Florida. So let's talk a little bit about some of the special features of the program. Uh, there is mandatory attendance. This is one of the ways that we um, work through, um, that we, we really pay attention to you uh, when you're there and we get to know you. Um, it allows us to provide very good detailed um, letters of reference for you at the end of the program if you need one and at week five of spring semester if you are in the current application cycle. Um, and it allows us to evaluate your professionalism over the course of the year. As I mentioned earlier, that all of our lectures are video captured and you can review them um, afterward at your leisure. There are a lot of different group activities. You are put into small groups in fall semester and you work with that same group um, for the course of the fall semester and then you get put into a different group for spring semester. And although um, many students in this program, when they come in, I have heard this so many times, I don't like working in groups, it doesn't work for me, I'm not interested. And by the time people finish with this program, they like working in groups, they realize what a benefit it is and they start to voluntarily do study in groups. Um, as I, we mentioned before, there are mandatory advising program, uh, mandatory advising with our program directors, that is Dr. Roller and Dr. Weiler, myself, and the learning scientists, as well as professionalism evaluations. The learning scientists and the tutoring program um, support academic success. Uh, 
you know, right now, probably most of you will believe that biomedical knowledge supports your academic success. But your time management, your goal setting, your study strategies, and your exam taking skills also heavily support your academic success. And if you have all the knowledge you need, but none of the other stuff, you won't be able to succeed in medical school. And so we give you the whole package in order to help you succeed in medical school. We do provide a tutoring program and um, one of our GCP alumni, Sarah Sherman, who's um, a panelist here today, has been um, instrumental in supporting that tutoring program um, over the past couple of cohorts. And I'm sure she will um, speak to that when, with questions at the end of the session. Regarding professionalism, there are nine domains upon which we evaluate professionalism. Um, we evaluate your ability to be a self-directed learner. Um, we evaluate your uh, critical thinking skills, your resilience and dependability, your communication, your respect for your peers, your, um, you know, the, the room, the facilities, um, your, your um, the staff and your faculty and the course directors, program directors, et cetera. Um, we evaluate leadership and teamwork. We evaluate your ability to both give and receive feedback graciously. Um, we evaluate whether you are honest, trustworthy, and accountable. And we evaluate your compliance with um, the rules and regulations of FIU and um, HWCOM and the Graduate Certificate Program itself. When these things are not as expected, um, you know, we have a meets expectations, exceeds expectations kind of Likert scale. And if you are at, you know, we expect everybody to meet expectations. And many students will tell me, but why didn't I get a four out of four? Um, that's only a 75% when I meet expectations. It's not a numeric scale. And we just expect everybody to meet those expectations. When you need improvement, um, we, we will um, chat with you. We will provide you um, guidance. And um, this gives you, you know, as I mentioned, it's a coaching um, atmosphere here. And we provide lots of development opportunities for you to um, figure out how to be better um, next time. Barbara? Yes, thank you. So I think you're getting the idea that we think this is a very special program. And <laughs> we hope that you will um, understand some of the special features that we have incorporated into the program um, that we think are extremely advantageous for students who are desiring to go into medicine or any other health profession. Um, as Dr. Weiler has mentioned, we do have um, a tutoring uh, program um, by usually by our GCP alums uh, that are currently in our College of, Men of Medicine and they also do mentoring um, with you as well. We think this is very important. Um, we have formed a GCP student council um, that, that meets regularly and gives input to the faculty um, and we also um, encourage participation in committees, for example, we have a library advisory committee that is, um, is all factions of the College of Medicine, including the graduate certificate program to give input on maybe there's some special things you might like in the, in the library or some special uh, couch. We had a big thing about the couches <laughs> this year in the library. Uh, so we do, we do welcome input from the GCP students. Um, uh, GCP students can participate in HWCOM medical student interest groups. We currently have about 35 to 40 interest groups um, in the College of Medicine in pretty much every specialty and subspecialty that you might um, be thinking about possibly going into or you just would like to explore more. Uh, we encourage attendance at HWCOM seminars, journal clubs, and other, other events 
right now with COVID-19, we have a, a weekly journal club, which is hosted by uh, College of Medicine faculty, as well as medical students. Um, but um, during the year, we have a huge number of seminars, which is why when I've written back to some of you, if any of you are on this webinar and, and you want you to know, well, when, does the, when do the classes meet? Um, I've basically been saying from noon until 8 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays, because from noon till one are usually when the HWCOM seminars take place, because that's pretty much the only time that all the medical students um, can be out of class in order to attend these, these seminars. Um, community service events, um, whenever we have food drives or we have toy drives or we have clothing drives or, or um, uh, I don't know, any kind of, any kind of drives for, um, for baked goods or for toiletries for our neighborhood health families. Um, GCP students are encouraged to, to participate um, both at the medical school and when they go outside of the medical school and do community service um, as well. We have something called STEM Saturdays that our medical students run um, for um, underserved um, uh, neighborhood children um, in which they go out and they teach um, uh, certain uh, obviously STEM related uh, experiments to the students. It's run by the medical students, but also with participation by GCP students. Other things are, uh, this is where I am extremely busy right now, um, because now that the new application cycle has opened, um, those of you who are in the process of applying, you know that it, AMCAS opened May 4th, uh, uh, ACOMA's open May 5th, and every, it seems like everybody needs a personal statement and a description of their experiences. So, um, so I will meet with all, all of you um, to go over personal statement and all your application um, documents to make sure that you are presenting the best application possible. We do have, and this is something that not all medical schools have, in fact, most do not. We have our own HWCOM Office of Financial Assistance we have actually four full-time staff people that take care of the, the MD program, the PA program, as well as the GCP program students um, in giving them advice, disbursement in the case of PA and, and MD, but also advice for GCP students as to, um, as to how you're going to pay for this wonderful program. So now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the guarantee because um, I get a lot of questions with regard to, um, you know, well, why should I do this program as opposed to another program? Well, we have two guarantees. For those students who are currently waitlisted at HWCOM, as you can see, if you earn a GPA greater or equal to 3.7 and you meet or exceed all our professionalism expectations that Dr. Weiler just told you about, you will earn a seat in the very next HWCOM MD class, right? That assumes that you've applied for, for this cycle. So if you're, if you're applying now for GCP, you also would be applying to, on AMCAS um, for, this, for this next cycle for 2021. So, and, and perhaps you have some questions about that afterwards that we can address. For those students who are not currently waitlisted at HWCOM for this cycle, if you meet or if you get at least a 3.7 and also meet or exceed expectations in professionalism, then you'll earn an interview for um, an MD admission cycle. So if you're currently in the application cycle at the time you're in GCP, you will be interviewed um, in February of the same year and you can get accepted for the very following year. If, you're, if you have not applied to us, um, then, and you get at least a 3.7 GPA, um, and you are gonna be applying for the following cycle, then you will earn an interview for that next cycle. So I hope that's clear. If not, please, please ask. So, so the question we also get asked is, so what happened? Where are, where are your students? So um, when, for this fourth cohort, um, 
The verdict is not in because many students are still on wait lists at medical schools. Um, but we can tell you that um, of the 129 students who completed um, the GCP, uh, 88 students are currently in medical school. Um, but we want you to keep in mind that of these three cohorts, not all students have yet applied uh, to medical school. So the question is, um, well, where do they go? You can see that students go to both MD programs and DO programs. Some of our students go to the Caribbean. Um, the HWCOM is in red um, because um, of the students who, who apply um, to medical school who were on our wait list, um, we have the majority of them are actually coming to HWCOM. So what we know from the four cohorts, because the verdict is still out on those who were waitlisted, um, of the 77 students who, who took GCP after being on the wait list, we know that 63 of them are now in medical school and 46 of them are right here in our own HWCOM. So, um, so we're very proud of that. Um, and certainly this is a great pathway, um, not only to any medical school, but also to our own uh, College of Medicine. And so the next question that you're probably asking is, yeah, well, how do they do in medical school? And so we have been very diligent about um, tracking our students. Uh, we, have, we have just finished our fourth cohort of GCP and therefore we have um, GCP alumni at HWCOM who have completed periods one, two, and three. So they are going into their fourth year of medical school. And if you look, um, our GCP, this is the beginning of first year on the far left of the plot. And in dark blue, we have the, the um, percentage out of 100 of the GCP alumni in comparison to their non-GCP peers. And across all of the courses, they are competitive or um, exceed uh, the performance of the GCP, uh, of the non, their non-GCP peers. And this is particularly impressive given that the undergraduate GPA of the GCP group is lower than the non-GCP students, as well as the MCAT scores. Um, the mean MCAT score of the GCP group is lower than that of their non-GCP peers. And so this is the, um, the first cohort of students in, um, that we uh, had at GCP. And here is the second cohort of students who have now completed first and second year only, and they're just starting their third year now. And again, the dark blue is our GCP students, and in gold is the non-GCP um, peers. And you can see that they are still um, you know, competing or um, outperforming their peers in medical school. Okay, cost of attendance, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the cost of attendance. Um, well, we have to tell you how much it's gonna cost because I know that that certainly is a, a concern. Although some would say education is priceless, you still have to pay the bill. So um, the tuition, for the two semesters is $18,000. It's $9,000 a semester. We can't get away with um, not having you pay university fees. Those go for things like athletics, parking, um, everything that the, the university supplies to any student, and those fees are fixed um, by the university. We have books. Um, in our cost of attendance sheet, um, we have books at, a at $500 a, a semester, um, but this is a little bit, it's quite a bit elevated. Um, our faculty try to have you just get eBooks, so you do not have to purchase the books unless you, unless you wish to. There may be some courses that, that do have a book that you have to um, purchase, but for the majority of the courses, there's no reason to purchase a book. The books are also um, on reserve in the library, any book that is, um, is required or is recommended will be 
in our College of Medicine library. So, so the books are a thousand dollars is a little bit inflated um, for the books. As far as living costs, okay, living, okay, there's many different ways that people live. Um, as I'm sure when you were undergrads, there were many different ways people lived. Um, some people will live at home. That's obviously the most cost effective. Um, uh, if you if you have a, a good living arrangement with your with your family and you can also study and you get along with them. So um, some live at home. Um, some live in very modest apartments. And there are, for those of you who are not familiar with the campus, um, there are uh, a lot of apartment complexes that are pretty close to the, to the campus. Um, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, up and down 107th Avenue, whether you're going toward Kendall or you're going toward Doral, there are a lot of apartment complexes that people, people will live in. Um, or some people have uh, luxury apartments. Um, and we know that some students um, will opt to live in Miami Beach or they'll opt to live in Brickell, which if you're from out of the area, you don't know what that means. But those are the luxury high rises um, with doormen and valets, et cetera. Um, and so that's up to you. So, so really what you have to consider is your tuition and fees, your books are going to be way less than $1,000, and then your, your living costs. Um, it depends where you, you know, what kind of lifestyle you're going to have as far as room board, transportation, if you live close to the school, or if you live in, there's a housing complex right across 107th Avenue, and some people walk. Um, there's also housing um, right across Southwest 8th Street, and again, some people walk, then you don't have a lot of transportation uh, expenses. And then of course your personal expenses. And so that's kind of up to you. So I would encourage you not to be um, overwhelmed with the total cost of attendance um, that is shown at the bottom. Um, however, if you will be taking out private educational loans, this is what you will supply to your lender so that you can get up to the cost of attendance. You might not want it, and we would not encourage you to take up to the cost of attendance in a loan, but it, it would, that amount of money would be available to you from a lender. So, okay, so now um, we have a special video that we wanted to show you. So at orientation for this class that just completed, um, we had asked GCP alumni to come and we do this every year and um, I videotaped what some of the students were saying to the, to the new GCP students. I thought this, um, this little, um, it's only like two minutes or less than two minutes, um, by Ashley Ramirez, who's a, who is a second year medical student, was particularly um, uh, important for you to listen to. So I hope you enjoy it. So when I first joined the GCP program, I came in with a huge sense of disappointment because at the time I was on three different wait lists. I was hoping they'd call me back. I came in, you know, disappointed I wasn't starting med school right then. But after going through the GCP program, starting medical school now, it's given us such a huge leg up. We're miles ahead of our classmates. We already know the material. We've already been exposed to most of the material. And if I had a choice now, Back then, having started medical school, right then, right there, or going through the GCP program, I would 100% go through the GCP program again. 100%. So, when I first joined the GCP <laughs> So, um, so that, was, that was an unsolicited, um, and I apologize for the audio, but basically they were just standing in the front of an auditorium and I was zooming in when, when students were talking with my, um, with my old fashioned video camera. So before we get into what makes a great applicant, I just wanted to give you um, a little other information about um, who are our students, who comes to the GCP program. And so I thought I would, I thought I would just add that we have a whole lot of different types of students with different backgrounds that come in. Some students have just graduated from with their bachelor's degree and they really maybe are uncertain about whether or not they're gonna to go to medical school, whether even gonna apply. 
Um, some students are sure that they're going to go to medical school, but they have not yet applied to medical school. In fact, some of our students have not taken the MCAT yet. Other students are reapplicant to medical school, um, and some of them are re reapplicants, and they really want to get a handle on what makes a great applicant for medical school. So um, some of them are non traditional students, and some of them have been out of school doing many other things for many years. We've had students come into the program who have been in the military for a while, who have been in business, who have been teaching. Um, who have been doing research, who have other degrees, maybe MPHs or master's degrees in molecular biology already. Um, so it's a wide variety of, of applicants. So, so don't be afraid if you've been out of school for a while, um, you will not be, you'll not be alone. And don't be afraid if you are just graduating from college, you will also not be alone. So, that being said, what makes a great applicant for our program? So obviously you're gonna need a bachelor's degree. It's a graduate program. Um, if you have not totally, if you don't have a transcript that indicates your bachelor's degree yet because schools are just finalizing transcripts, that's fine. You can send the transcript. And then when you get a final transcript, you send, you send it to us. So there's no problem with that. But you do have to have a bachelor's degree completed before the program. Uh, we expect an overall GPA and BCPM, the biology, chemistry, physics, math GPA of greater than 3.0. Um, if you don't have one greater than 3.0, we find two things. One, um, particularly if you haven't done well in your science classes, you may not be doing very well in the GCP program in those science classes, number one. And number two, um, even if you do well in the GCP program, but your BCPM is really, really low, it may be a problem for you when you apply to medical school. And these are all things that, that um, I'm glad to discuss with you and your particular situation. So the next thing is all pre-med requirements must be completed. The GCP courses do not take the place of whatever the basic pre-med courses are which for at least for FIU or Bio 1 2, Chem 1 2, Organic 1 2, Physics 1 2, and two maths and, and two Englishes. Um, and that's what they are expecting. Of course, in order to be a successful applicant and also to do well on the MCAT, we do expect that you have taken biochemistry at the least, plus other upper division science courses. Um, motivation for a career in medicine. Um, how are we going to find that out? We're going to find that out. Um, by reading your personal statement and also by what people, your letters of recommendation writers will say about you. Also, um, what you indicated you've done. If you don't have any clinical experience and you say you want to be a doctor, then, then how do we know that you even know what you're getting into, right? So the personal statement is really important and that's where you can incorporate some of the things that you have done so that we realize that yes, you're motivated for a career in medicine and you know what a career in medicine entails. Okay, also great letters of recommendation from faculty who, who know you well. Um, so we put G for great again, everything should be great if you're a great applicant, right? Um, a letter of recommendation that just says that person is, has been in my class and got an A is not super helpful. Um, so get letters of recommendation from faculty who know you well. The MCAT for our program is optional, unlike many other graduate programs where the MCAT is required. The reason is that we know some of the students have come into our program with a less than stellar MCAT, but we also know that after they complete our program, they are going to have a stellar MCAT, and we have that over many of the three cohorts of, of students who have taken and retaken the MCAT. Um, and then some students, as I mentioned before, have, come, have not even taken the MCAT and are planning on taking the MCAT after the conclusion of uh, the GCP program. Typically, um, what we see from students who have taken it before and not had a stellar performance on the MCAT and then they take it again afterwards, 
there is often a 10 point increase in the total MCAT score after the program, if not higher. So how to apply? Well, our deadline is June 15th. Um, we have, we have a, a little bit complicated system of applying, but it really is, is kind of like when you apply on AMCAS, you do a, one application and then you also have to do secondary applications. So, so here it's one application to the graduate school. So the first step is to apply to the university graduate school. That's like applying to AMCAS. And you send your official transcripts to the university graduate school. Um, they have a $30 application fee for any, any program at FIU, no matter what program you're applying to, it's a $30 application fee. So you have to pay the application fee, send your official transcripts, and just fill out basically your biodemographic information and your residency information um, on the university graduate school application, whether or not you are claiming Florida residency, because the tuition is the same um, for Florida residents or not for our program, but it's not so for other programs. Then the this next step or concurrently is the graduate certificate departmental application. You can do them both at the same time. You can do the graduate certificate application first, whichever order you want. However, you must have both of them done. Um, the, the graduate certificate departmental application um, includes a personal statement. The personal statement is 5,300 characters, which is some of you may recognize the same thing as an AMCAS or ACOMAS personal statement. Um, but we want to know your motivation for a career in healthcare, but also we want to know um, why specifically you would like this program. So look at the prompt because it's not the same prompt as when you apply to medical school. We do want to know why you're considering this program. Um, we do want two letters of recommendation. The letters of recommendation should be from science faculty, um, but science faculty who know you. Um, and so if this is a problem, please contact, it, contact me, especially if you've been out of school for a long period of time um, and may not have kept up a relationship with science faculty. However, keep in mind that when you apply to medical school, they will expect that you will have two letters from science faculty. So it's a good idea to go back to your school. Well, I can't go back, but to contact your professors, um, you know, maybe do a Zoom um, meeting with them, um, send them, you know, anything that they would like, such as your, your transcript, your, your, your CV, your personal statement, your experience sections, and even a photo of yourself, because I found that students that I've had years ago that now want a letter of recommendation, I am not sure if I remember who that person is. So I asked for a photo. So it cannot hurt um, to do that as well. Um, so again, if anybody has any questions about the two steps, again, you need to do both sides and they can be done um, at the same time. The links to both of those applications are at the bottom. One is through One Stop Admissions um, in Graduate School, and the other one is our biomedcert.medicine.fiu.edu. So if this sounds great, don't just take our word for it. So what we would like to do now is involve our GCP alumni who are our panelists, and they will be sharing their perspective. They're gonna tell you a little bit about themselves first um, and their, ro their route to the graduate certificate program, their route to medical school. Um, and then they'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So does anybody have any questions? Who should we start with first as the, as the panelist? Sarah, she was the first one on the webinar. Is yes, we'll start with Sarah. At the moment, there are no specific um, questions for the panelists, so maybe we can start with um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to medical school. Okay, uh, so my name is Sarah Sherman. I am currently an M3 um, and waiting to start rotations hopefully soon. Um, so my journey to GCP, so I went to the University of Florida. 
I graduated a year early in 2015, um, and I ended up teaching high school for two years afterwards. Um, and then uh, I had applied to medical school um, and was waitlisted and ended up coming to um, GCP in 2017. So I was in the second cohort. Um, and I did get the 3.7. So um, I was accepted for the class of um, 2022 to HWCOM. Um, since then, I have, um, GCP is something I'm extremely passionate about. I was one of those kids, like Dr. Weiler said, that came in swearing I would never in my life study in a group. Um, and I basically was there to get the GPA that I needed to get and to get to med school. And um, this program, like a lot of the things that they highlighted, uh, brought me some of my best friends that are still my friends in med school um, and have allowed me a level of, um, I would just say support in medical school uh, that's gotten me through some pretty rough times over the past couple of years, both the faculty that continues to support you um, as well as your classmates. Um, and as Dr. Weiler mentioned, um, tutoring is something I'm super passionate about. Um, so I've done that for the last two years and hopefully um, we'll be handing off the reins to one of our um, cohorts behind me who are also super passionate about it. So um, it's been my honor to be a part of this program and um, I'm really excited to meet this new incoming class of um, GCP babies. Is Tom on the call? Yeah, I'm here, Dr. Weiler. Excellent. All right, so my journey was very similar to Sarah's. Not identical, but very similar. Um, I also graduated from the University of Florida uh, in 2016. I think I did, I did two years at the University of Florida. And then I took one gap year where I was just working full time as a scribe uh, and as a pharmacy tech. And then the second year, uh, the first year I got waitlisted in my F, uh, FIU. So then I got the invite to join the GCP program. So in 2017, in our second cohort, I was also a part of the GCP program. And honestly, it has been fantastic. I've made like lifelong friends. Me and Sarah are still best buddies in all of our classes today. Uh, you know, we've started from GCP all the way through M3 now. And we're both just sitting here waiting for our rotation to start. And I know that like, it may seem like when you start this program, it seems like you guys are all like fighting each other to try to get that three step and you all want to have an upper edge. and You just feel like it's very competitive. But at the end of the day, if you put in the hard work, you will see the results that you want. And you will get the results that you want. So try to make some friends along the way so that you'll have those people to lean on, people that you can always trust, lifelong friends like everyone GCP. Yeah, fun fact, Tom sat behind me in GCP, and at first I was not sure because I was like, man, he's competition, and now that's one of my best friends. We literally sit together in every class, so you have no idea who you're going to be sitting next to on day one that's going to end up being your best friend in med school. So, Brian Cabrera, are you on the call yet? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Cabrera. I was uh, born and raised in Cuba and I moved here in 2012. I went to Miami Dade College and I got my associate in arts there and then I transferred to FIU when I got, where I got my um, bachelor's in biology. Then after that, I applied to GCP and I was part of the third cohort. And after that, I, I was, as I was finishing my bachelor, I applied to med school and I was waitlisted. So I was one of those kids that when I already applied to GCP, I was already waitlisted. Um, so after that, I got the, the 3.7 and I got accepted into med school. Um, I wanted to say that Sarah was a blessing for all of us. Um, she helped us a lot and she's really invested in the program. And like a huge part of my class, it's so thankful because of, of all she did and because of all we learned in GCP. Um, it literally makes a difference. It's, I'm not gonna lie, it's a hard program, but so it's med school. And if you want to be ready, it's a great program to do. Um, 
friend-wise, uh, right now I am in one of my uh, friend's uh, house that I made in GCP, uh, Javier. And actually like the four kids that are here are like GCP kids. It's Dalen Alonso, uh, Javier and Alicia, which is part of another um, cohort. Uh, but she also made it and we are all study for a pulmonary test that we have on on Friday but I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to go there so um yeah if you have any questions just let us know Luis Ortiz tell us about your experience hello um, my name is Luis and um, so my, my journey to get into medical school, um, was a pretty long one. I graduated from college in 2015 and I had applied in 2014 and ever since I've been applying every year. So I pretty much got either waitlisted or, or rejected, uh, like three, at least like four times. Um, during that period, I worked full time as a chemist uh, while I was also applying to medical school. And so it's been a very long journey to get here. And then the last time that I was waitlisted, it was at FIU. And I saw the, um, I saw the, um, the UCP program as an opportunity to prove myself that I could do this because oftentimes they only look at your application, they look at your MCAT. And in, to me, those were really huge obstacles, uh, especially the MCAT was a huge obstacle for me. Um, my scores were always a little bit above average, but not quite competitive to uh, give schools a, a definite answer. So when I saw GCP, I, I saw it as an opportunity to prove myself that I could do it, that I could get into medical school and that I can succeed in medical school. And, you know, I just want to thank the program directors and, and all the faculty and staff and everybody that helped me along the way because it was not an easy journey uh, in GCP. It was, I, I like, I like to compare GCP as, as cardiology. That's the field that, that I, that I like. That's what I want to do in the future because cardiology, the heart is very simple, but once you get into the details of it, it gets extremely complicated. And GCP felt the same way because I'm sure in this presentation, you saw that all you have to do is just do well, just meet the requirements. That's all. Like there's really no tricks. If you're waitlisted, you do well, you get a 3.7, you go to medical school. That's it. It's really simple. But to get there, you need a lot of support. There's a lot of uh, trial and error with your strategies uh, for exams, for studying. And you really get to know yourself uh, at that level. It's something that you can't really compare to anything else, just like medical school. And the friends you make along the way are very representative of how medical school is as well. Uh, like Brian said, um, um, you know, we all become family by the time we're done. And uh, if you have any other questions or anything like that, just drop them in the chat. And yeah, that was a quick little summary of, of my experience. And Lewis, you went to FAU, yeah? Yes, I went to FAU in Boca. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, Caesar. Hello, everyone. Um, for me, my journey, I, I graduated uh, from the University of Miami back in 2016. And the whole time that I was in college, I had to I had to work for financial reasons. And I felt like that took away a lot of time for me to get involved with extracurricular activities, uh, especially uh, clinical stuff. So uh, once I graduated, I decided to uh, to take some time to really involve myself. In, in clinical activities to shadowing, uh, volunteering, uh, work in the medical field, um, and to prepare myself for the MCAT and all that. Um, 
it, it, there was a couple of years of that. And then what happened is that I felt like I distanced myself from the academic part of the experience. So I thought that, uh, that GCP was the perfect opportunity to jump back right into it. And, um, and that was really the case. Uh, I mean, the whole cohort aspect of it, uh, the group activities really generates a family dynamic where we all come really close and we learn to work with one another. I, I wasn't one of those, I was one of those people that didn't study in groups before. And then after this, I can't see myself going back to not doing any kind of group study at some point because it, it really helps me to get that feedback from my peers and, and interact and talk about concepts. Um, but yeah, I really, I learned how to learn, which was the most important thing um, from GCP for me. And yeah, and then after, after GCP, I applied to medical school um, and I'm starting out in July. And I, and I, I mean, I'm just really excited to be here to sell you on the merits of GCP. Um, I was actually a teaching assistant for medical genetics last semester um, in GCP as well, just because I, I, I really believe in, in the power of it and I want to help it as much as possible and be involved. So yeah, that's my little summary. Thank you. Venus, our first uh, member of cohort four. Are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi, everybody. So I am Venus. Um, I am part of this last cohort. Uh, we just finished, we just graduated. And um, I think we will forever be known as the unfortunate cohort because we, <laughs> <laughs> we literally had everything you could possibly like throw at us, like we were like dodging things left and right. Um, but we managed to we managed to complete the semester. So I'm very proud of all of us that managed to get through it. Um, GCP. Oh well, my journey to medical medical school. Um, so I graduated with my bachelor's from FIU in 2016, and I was teaching parasitology lab for about three years. Um, I tried studying for the MCAT like two or three times and every single time I studied, I started studying, I felt very overwhelmed and very scared. Um, and then it just got to the point where I was like, oh, okay, I've come too far. <laughs> I have like three years where I haven't been in, in, you know, any science classes or anything like that. And um, I decided to apply to GCP because I was thinking that maybe, you know, it was something that could help out with renewing the content, also something that could help out with my application. Um, I can definitely say now that if, just like, I mean, just like Ashley said, I if I had the choice to do it again, I would. Um, it doesn't matter how hard it was. It doesn't matter how much I cried. And I was a crier. I cried a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like we used to all say to each other just you get five minutes so just go sit somewhere cry for five minutes wipe it off and go back and study again <laughs> so I cried a lot the first semester it's very difficult it's very hard you come in thinking oh it's a 3.7 like Lewis said it's it's very simple all you have to do is do good you know and you come from undergrad and you're thinking oh that's nothing you know I can get A's I can get B's what's so hard about it it's hard um and it's not so much of the hard but it's just how much how much dedication it really takes because it takes a lot of dedication and you really really have to know yourself and you really have to um ah did i go away did I go? um you really really have to know your content you really have to know yourself um and you really have to put in the work but it is so incredibly worth it um i feel like i learned so so much and not only content but I feel, I, I haven't taken the MCAT yet, so I actually um, just signed up for a test date, and I'm taking it August 7th, um, and, I'm, and I started studying. But I, not just because of content, but just because of the like, test-taking skills that you learn in GCP, you really, really learn how to, how to break down questions and look at things and say, you know, what does that really mean, you know? What are they asking me? What what is what is the answer that they're looking for? And I think that's I think that's really invaluable when it comes to you know to to your to your future in medical school and to your future as a doctor because you know ultimately you 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 want to know what's really wrong with this patient. They're telling me they have all these things, but what are they really trying to tell me? You know. So I I recommend to everybody. Um, take GCP. I know it's um, I know it's expensive, and I know you know it may be whatever it is, but it's a hundred percent worth it. And 
Um, I, I'm really, really glad that I did it. And I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, I'm really hoping that I can help anybody out, anybody, you know, if you guys need anything, um, I don't know if uh, we're going to get like a, we, we had a Facebook group last uh, semester or, you know, last year or whatever, where we could talk to the previous GCP cohort. So I don't know if that's going to happen this year, but I'm definitely willing to help anybody. If there's, you know, a Facebook chat or anything, please feel free to ask me whatever you guys, you know, whatever you guys want to ask. Um, I'm always here to help. So, um, my best advice is if you take GCP, if you go into GCP, don't give up, stick with it. It's completely worth it in the end. So. Thank you, Venus. Okay. Um, Alexis. Alexis Frez, are you on the call? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. So I'm Alexis. Um, I graduated from the University of Tampa in 2019. And so I had a... Um, I had a chemistry background. I graduated with a degree in forensic science, so I actually didn't know anything related to pretty much biology, biochemistry. I had all the prereqs, but it still wasn't, it's not the same as like what you need in medical school. So for me, like I knew how to analyze samples for toxicology or drug chemistry, but I could not tell you what anything about the Krebs cycle. I had no idea, let alone like what a kidney or lupa henle, like any of that. <laughs> and then after I graduated uh, college, I was rejected from all the medical schools I applied to. So I was like, well, got to do something, got to figure it out. So honestly, I had no idea what GCP was. I, I Googled schools in the state of Florida because I'm from Florida and was like, oh, what are programs that like help you get into medical school? GCP popped up. So I just applied. And I'm so grateful for that strike of luck, that strike like that luck, because <laughs> honestly, GCP was super, super helpful and was one of the most um, rewarding experiences that I've had. So now I'm actually um, going to start medical school in July at um, Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine in New Mexico, um, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And even though I haven't started yet, I have seen even just like um, other, you know, older students who are like giving you advice on what resources to use and things like that. And they're the same exact resources that we've been using in GCP all along. So going in, I have this sort of comfort and confidence that I may not know everything I need to know, but I'm familiar enough with the resources. I have the study techniques and the opportunity and the understanding of what's expected that I feel confident enough to go into medical school and that I can actually do well. Whereas looking back, I was completely out of my mind, not prepared at all for medical school. I was very like angry and upset that I didn't get in. And part of me was like, okay, I just have to do this program just so I can get in. But it's, it's more, than, more than that. GCP is a program that really teaches you this, not only like the knowledge, but it's the study skills. How do I prepare? How do I take care? Or how do I take in all of this information at once? That's how do I, I have to study for three exams in one day that are all in the same time back to back. How do I go from taking an exam to having to feeling not good about it and then quickly turn around and take another one, you know, things like that. And so I recommend GCP because it's a program that prepares you not only, you know, educationally, but also in terms of mentally, physically, in terms of emotionally, what you need for medical school um, in the long run. And that's why I'm also a huge proponent of GCP. I've made lifelong friends and I've also made, you know, understanding of things that have lasted me forever. Like the other day, my mom was talking about asking me a, a random thing about a genetic disorder and I whipped out a Punnett square in two seconds. And I was like, hey, this is Punnett square, like, this is how it's received, it's recessive, but and she, my brother was like, I don't know what that is, and it was, it's just one of those things that there are some things you just never forget, and GCP has instilled in me those skills and those knowledge, that knowledge that I just, like, won't ever, hopefully, ever forget now, but, um, but yeah, GCP is definitely something that I recommend if you, I struggled with the MCAT twice, if you struggle with the MCAT, struggle with your GPA, it's, a, it's a program that will help you get there, and it's tried and true based off of the data that you guys have, have been seen today, have been shown today. Thank you, Alexis. Mark, I know you're on the call. Hey, uh, I'm Mark. So I uh, graduated from FIU in 2018. And so my journey to medical school. So, so far, um, I have to retake the MCAT. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm also, when I finished this program, I basically figured out that there's a lot more to just getting into medical school that's important, at least in my case. Um, in my family, we own a clinic 
I actually wrote a couple of them. And at some point, I'm going to need to understand how to do business in this clinic because of unfortunate circumstances. <laughs> so I figured at some point, I'm going to have to be doing this in medical school. So I might as well do it now because I don't want to take another gap year. I've taken a lot of advice from faculty, I've taken a lot of advice from my peers. So what I'm going to end up doing is taking a healthcare MBA and already kind of get a head start on all this. So I feel like that experience and the advice given to me from the people of this program has really helped guide me into something that isn't just medical school. So I feel like that kind of goes to show that you can figure out a lot of things about your life, not just going for that one track mind. And I'm really, I'm really grateful for everything that happened there. And in terms of the knowledge that I've gained, you know, taking that and doing my MCAT and I, I cannot wait to take that MCAT again and just, and kill it. I'm so excited. Like it's so, it feels so weird to be excited to do that, but you are going to be studying so hard for these classes. You, it's going to be nothing compared to undergrad. And it sounds like it, like, it's weird because I, I almost sound happy about that, even though you're studying, but it's just because you're going to find so many ways to actually study that you're just going to have so many like big brain moments. You'll, you, you will see it's, and it will all come around It'll come full circle. But yeah, so, so far I'm working on getting my, uh, getting everything on track. And uh, if you guys have any questions or anything you want to ask me, feel free. Always open. Thanks, Mark. So I think Brooke is not on the call, but we did get um, Kristen Fox, who is um, a member of GCP Cohort 3, who has also joined us as a panelist. Um, and she, along with Caesar, is, um, were both TAs for my courses this past year and are both going to be members of the um, class of 2024 that starts in July here at HWCOM. So Kristen, would you like to say a few words about your journey? Yeah, hi. Um, Welcome. So <laughs> I graduated from FIU in 2016 with a bachelor's in psychology. And the year after I had applied for medical school and I was waitlisted at HWCOM. Uh, and then I heard about the GCP program. So I signed up for it with a good friend who's now my best friend, um, by then. <laughs> and it was probably the best thing I've ever done. And I would do it again if I had to. I loved it so much. I went back and was a TA. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did the program. I interviewed that year. I got waitlisted again. <laughs> and then... I came back, I was the TA, and then, like Dr. Weiler said, I got accepted this year, and I'm going to be starting with Caesar in the fall. Um, I was one that took my MCAT after I finished GCP, and I had taken it before, and it went up nine points, which was a lot. And I didn't study for it nearly as long as I did when I took it before, and I did so much better just because of all the study strategies and techniques that I had gained through GCP. Um, so if you guys have any questions about that, feel free to ask. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Um, I know Brian has some other GCB alumni in his room. I don't know if any of them are interested in saying anything or if um, there are any questions. We have some questions any. from the audience. Yes. Um, so I guess we can, I can try to answer some, some of the, oh, it looks like there's there's even more. They keep coming in. Um, yes, actually, but, I yeah, want to I, interrupt you. Yeah. Um, there's two questions for um, the panelists that are alumni. Maybe we can um, go through those first since there's fewer. Um, if one of the panelists wants to answer, what's a day in the life of a GCP student like? Good question. Okay. You, uh, <laughs> you study. You study. <laughs> yeah, go, 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 go. I studied a lot. I studied from like I would wake up, I would, you know, have my I, I drink tea, so I don't have I drink I don't drink coffee, but I would have my tea and then I would drive to FIU like around nine or ten AM. I would find we would find a room. We would find a room 
and we would set up and we wouldn't go home until probably eight o'clock at night, seven, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, and that wasn't always, that was a lot, but that wasn't always, that was usually either before a quiz, cause you get a quiz. So every two classes you have a quiz. Um, so that was usually before quizzes. Sometimes uh, you get a quiz on a Thursday. So classes are Tuesdays, Thursdays. Sometimes when you get a class, when you get a quiz on a Thursday, um, then you have to study stuff from like Tuesday and from the pre, you guys will get it. But we studied a lot before quizzes. And then the week of exams, it was, it was just every day, every day, every day. And then you get the four day break because then you take your exams Thursday. And then you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday where you're off. And then Tuesday you do review. Uh, and then usually most classes start again on Tuesday. Some of them don't. Dr. Weiler's don't. We do review. And then we start again on Thursday. So, um, but you study a lot. You make sure that you take time off because you need time off. Take a day. Tell yourself to go do something else because you will burn out if you don't do something else. Like that happened to me a lot in the very beginning where I just was very frustrated because I didn't know how to study. Um, that's another thing that you're going to find out that you're going to, you're going to do, I think like a lot of trial and error stuff where you're like, okay, well I'm going to do this. And then you do it for, you know, the first set of quizzes and then you bomb the quizzes and then you're like, okay, well I'm going to do something else now. <laughs> <'Cause that didn't laughs> <work. laughs> so then you spend some other time doing something else and then you kind of tweak it and like, you will figure out, what works for you and what doesn't for each particular class. Um, but then, you know, once it kind of clicks, it's kind of like magic. You know, it just, you just like, okay, well now I know exactly what my plan is. I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. And then it becomes a little bit easier as I think as the semester goes on it, you know, when it's, when everything kind of starts to click and you figure out, okay, for this class, I have to do this. For this one, I have to do a bunch of questions. I don't necessarily have to listen to the Tigerities again. I just have to do a bunch of questions. But um, I'm going to tell you, you guys are going to study a lot. You guys are going to study a lot, but make sure to take time off. You know, that's, that's my advice. That's my two cents. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, Ryan? Yeah, I, I always like to answer to this question because I am a different person since I took GCP and we have talked about it a lot. Um, when I came to GCP, uh, I, I came in with my best friend and I had that mentality of getting that 3.7 and, and move on and, and that's it. And I will say that Brian is one of those students that thought that he could do it without sleep and his eyes were about the color of tomato juice at some point. Uh, I was going to get there. <laughs> uh, so first thing, it's, um, yeah, uh, a lot of people get in with that mentality of, of getting done 3.7, of, of being super focused, of not actually caring about like anything else but that. Um, that's not going to happen. At the end of the day, you're going to be a family. Like right now, as I said before, I'm here studying with the same people that, uh, that did GCP with us. And, and you're going to be a family at the end of the day. That's one thing. Another thing is, uh, because you're going to be a family, yes, you're going to be studying a lot because you won that 3.7. And I studied so much, and I always said this, that two things happened. First thing that happened was that uh, Waze changed my address from my home to FIU. So if I would, if I would click on Waze, my home address will be the FIU address. And and Kristen is here, and she can tell that I'm not lying. <laughs> and another thing, it's that yes, you're gonna do study a lot, but you are gonna be studying mostly with your friends and you're gonna be supported by all the faculty and it's, it's, it's not gonna be so painful, hard times. That's one thing. Another thing is um, I'm a second year mega student right now. Like I just um, passed to second year, if, if you will. Uh, and GCP doesn't just teach you the content, it, teach, it teaches you how to study. It teaches you, it, it gives you the tools that you would need to, to do well in medical school. 
and I'm so glad that I took it and I'm so glad that I did this program because I was one of those who believed that they made a mistake that I should have been accepted because I was ready for medical school and I just took GCP to prove the medical commission or, or whatever that they were wrong and that I was, I, I was going to be, like I was supposed to be accepted, which was a huge mistake because I didn't know how to study. I didn't know I was not prepared at all for medical school. And I'm so glad that I went through GCP and that I actually gained all, all those tools before uh, uh, getting accepted into, into medical school. Um, so a day in, in, in my day was study, 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 and be with your friends, find uh, uh, the group that will support you and support your group too. And there's nothing like there's nothing else you can do, you know, just do your best. There's going to be a lot of, of, of trial and error. Um, not like not all the things are going to go as you plan, but as Dr. Weiler usually said, like uh, it's not three point seven or nothing. And you cannot be thinking of, of the three point seven. You got to go like step by step and you got to fix your mistakes step by step. And then you're gonna see how little by little you're gonna be getting better and getting better and getting better and getting better until you don't notice, but you're there. And you go like, how 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 I got here? Like I haven't like this is this is getting it's it's not getting too easy because you're never gonna say that, okay? But it's not as extremely hard as it was before. Does so, anybody else want to say anything about a day in the life that Brian and Venus haven't already mentioned? There are two other questions for the panelists that came up in the Q&A. Um, one is, has anyone utilized the Office of Financial Aid at FIU and how, is, how, how has it helped you? I assume they must mean in the HWCOM because that's very different than the Office of Financial Aid at FIU. Has anybody, has any one of you done or I know they send emails all the time about payments due and things of that sort. Um, has any any of the panelists gone to um, financial assistance in HWCOM? I can say something. I had an experience with not with HWCOM but with I don't know if they mean like the, the university one. Um, when I asked for my loan, um, if you guys see that your loan is not being posted to your like account call them every day, every single day, call them morning and afternoon and they'll post it so, so you guys know. Yeah, because we do have our own Office of Financial Assistance and they can, they can um, kind of troubleshoot for you, but they, since there are no federal loans for this program, um, students have to do private pay or they have to get uh, private educational loans. Which, can, which are monitored by the HWCOM Office of Financial Assistance. Well, that wasn't a biggie. Okay, how about um, the next one? Um, do students have part-time jobs during this program and is it possible? Um, that's, always, that's always a question that I get as well. Would any of you like to, to take that? Did any of you try to work during the um, program? How did it uh, work out? I could I could answer that. Um, well, you know, part of it. Uh, I was working full time uh, prior to start uh, starting on the fall, um, and then um, I'm sorry, did I say full time, part time on the weekend? So I was working uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, regular eight hour shift um, at a laboratory. Uh, like I said earlier, I was a chemist. So it was very flexible because I had like the keys to the lab and I could go in whenever I wanted, do my eight hours of work and, and just finish. Um, that quickly stopped like two weeks after. Um, it went down to just Sundays because I needed some sort of income um, to just pay for food. So I figured just one day was enough to just get a little allowance. Um, and then that changed at the end of fall because it even just working one day on Sundays, which gave me time to rest and keep uh, keep up with work, 
after on Mondays before going back to school on Tuesday, even that was not easy to do. Those eight hours really do matter, not only for your academics, but also for your mental health, because I was just basically studying every day. Tuesday, Thursdays, you don't really get a chance to study in the afternoon because you're in class all day. So you do your studying in the morning, then you're in school all day. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you study and rest. And if you throw work in there, you're taken away from your rest time. And it quickly piles up. So it's not recommended mentally for you to work. Can you physically do it? Yes, it is physically doable. I did do it but it is not recommended mentally even even though i'm like i'm a go-getter like i'm gonna do it i did it and even for me it was too much and i was like okay i can't work so then spring it was only gcp that's all i did um so yeah that's my take on it thank you i also um i also worked around 24 hours a week during uh GCP and it was it was difficult. I had to be really efficient with the way that I studied and come up with different strategies. I would definitely uh, not recommend it at all. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's my take on that. I also want to be able to comment on that as well because I was uh, working full time right before the GCP program, and I think I was sitting through the orientation just similar to this, and everyone from the first cohort was like. If you want to succeed and pass, you, you cannot be working. There's, there's just no time possible for you to be working and try to take care of all your studies as well. Um, they also, it's also something worth mentioning. It seems like there's a lot of free time in the sense of you only have class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but outside of that, there's so much material to digest and try to understand. And it's just, it becomes a lot. And it's, it's similar to just being in medical school. It's essentially the same workload as if you were in medical school. Maybe a little less, but it's still, it becomes like your full-time job essentially. And like being able to, I guess, set aside time to not work, aka working, being, meaning studying, is pretty difficult to manage as well. So that was just my take. So we have another question for the panelists. Oh, did you want to say something, Brian? No, I was going to say that um, that I also quit my job. I was working as a scribe before starting G uh, GCP, and I realized that um, that I had to quit because I didn't have time to 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 study, and I really wanted to treat GCP like my, my golden ticket for med school. So I was like, I'm gonna give it all. I'm gonna I'm gonna give all I take, all all I have. Sorry, and I'm gonna try my very, very best. And I know that like, if I am working, I'm not going to be able to do so. So that's why I quit it. Okay, thank you. So we have another question uh, for the panelists. What study techniques did you find useful during the program in order to succeed? Um, a couple of you have answered already um, the question, but if anybody wants to expand Um, I can jump in. Oh, Sarah. Sorry. No, no. It's <laughs> Sarah. Go to all her views. Sarah is amazing. Yes, definitely go to Sarah um, or whoever's. I don't even know who's taking it over next. But for me, um, something I wasn't really doing before, like an undergrad, was group study. Um, but I learned quickly that it's that was like my saving grace. Um, so what I would do is the first day after class, I would do my own studying. So whether that's watching sketchy micro videos and taking my own notes or doing practice problems, going through lectures. But then after I would do my own individual studying, I would realize, okay, there are still concepts I don't understand. So then my friends and I would get together the day after and we'd walk through concepts together. If I don't understand something, but let's just say Mark does, then not only is he explaining it to me to me in a way that I can understand it, but he's also learning it himself, really like hammering in those concepts by teaching it to somebody else. So that to me was really helpful in terms of trying to learn something, whether that's hearing it a different way from another student or teaching it to somebody else. Cause you think, okay, I think I, I know, I got this, I got this. And then you get questions and you're like, okay, I have no idea what's going on. But if you can teach it to somebody else, <laughs> then you realize where the gaps are in your understanding. And that was one of the most valuable 
study techniques, study, you know, skills that I learned in GCP. Thank you. Um, I, also, um, I mentioned this in the, in the answer as well, but, um, but self-testing was really key for, for my study. Um, uh, what I would do is that I would uh, put everything away in the, and then just go through the session learning objectives because you get, you get five per every session in every class and that would guide, um, and that would guide my studying. I would try to write as much as possible answering the question presented in the learning objective. And then uh, that would allow me to review because I would be writing what I knew. And then I would identify what I didn't know and then just spend more time focused on that aspect of the, the concept. So that was really helpful for me. Yeah, another thing that I would strongly recommend is test yourself. Practice questions are very important. Um, so do a couple of passes through a material and then test yourself because that's that's another good way for you to know what you actually know and what you actually don't know. And sometimes you do know it, but the way they're asking the question, it's kind of like, I don't know what's happening here. And then when you read the question and you read the answer and you review the question, you go like, oh, no, yes, I, I know this, but you just didn't know how they ask it. Right, so that's another tool that you don't you don't want to miss either. However, whatever works for me or for Louis or for Caesar or for whoever it's it's in here, it's it's not the same. So you're gonna find your own way, and believe me, a lot of people are gonna be doing a lot of different stuff. Do what works for you, and what doesn't work for you, change it, modify it, but whatever strategy that you have that's working don't change it don't change it because someone else it's doing it and it's it's getting good grades don't do it because everyone it's not the same i also want to add um just uh, something that i found super helpful um specifically you guys will find out dr Weiler's class is very different from everyone else's um she will ask you questions that you were like, you would just read them and you're like, <sighs> and you have to sigh and really, really think. And something that really, really helped, helped me, you know, understand the kinds of things and the way that she was asking stuff is to look through her slides and think about, you know, when she shows you a pathway or something, think about what's really going on. What, what is what is interacting with what what's what is you know what is this factor doing and what is the role of this what is what what is what role does this play in in, in the pathway and if you knock that out what's going to happen um so really kind of try to dissect those things and i found that sitting there and looking at the slide and saying okay well like actually talking out loud and saying this is going here and then this is doing this and, and 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 you know if you knock this out this is what's going to happen i found that really 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 helpful for her exams because when she asks you, you know, well, what happens when you knock this out or something, then you know exactly what's going to happen because all the down, you know, all the effects, you're going to have to talk to them, talk to yourself about them in your head already. So I, I found that super helpful. Thank you. Um, so I think that was all for the uh, questions for the panelists. Thank you so much for your input and for joining us today. Um, we have a couple questions that are for Dr. Weiler and Dr. Roller now about um, program. Yeah, um, there's a lot. Application. A lot um, of questions. <laughs> I'm sort of going to like mix all the MCAT questions for you, Dr. Roller. Um, okay. Some of the questions that have come in have been, um, do you need to retake um, the MCAT um, after GCP? Um, what is a competitive MCAT to apply for GCP? Mm -hmm. um, right. So, yeah. Um, all right, so let me, let me take one at a time, um, and then I'll get to the, the GPA because everybody seems to be focused on the 3.7, yeah. and it's not necessary to focus on that 3.7. So as far as an entering um, MCAT for, um, for GCB, an MCAT is not necessary because many students take it afterwards. We, um, you can put what your MCAT is on the GCB application, um, but that's not really a factor because it's not required of all of all students and we're not verifying it anyway. Um, so um, that's with the entering MCAT. Um, yes, and if you're applying on AMCAS, 
you need still a competitive MCAT. So even if you get a 3.7 and you get a guaranteed interview and you're interviewed, if your MCAT is not competitive um, for HWCOM, um, you're not likely to be accepted anyway. So yes, an MCAT is something that is, that is necessary. If you haven't taken the MCAT yet, that's perfectly fine. You'll take it afterwards. Then you focus on getting good grades and get, guaranteed, get a guaranteed interview for us. Also be a very competitive um, applicant for any other medical school to which you're applying because we know that you're gonna be applying to not only at FIU, but, but other medical schools while you're, while you're in this program. So that's a little bit about the MCAT. But let me just say something about the 3-7 because I know the- Barbara? Do you want to tell them what a competitive MCAT for, for HWP is? Oh, for, H, for FIU? Well, you should all be familiar with what's known as the MSAR. Um, hopefully you are. Um, but um, medical, student, medical school admission requirements, um, which always give the, the median MCAT score, GPAs, a lot of information about each of the medical schools. Um, for FIU, it's approximately a 510. Um, 500, as I'm sure you know, is like 50th percentile of all test takers. Um, but for FIU, it's approximately 510. But that being said, um, we have had students between, you know, between a 500 and approximately a 522 um, matriculate in our class. So with holistic review, not only about the MCAT, right? But, um, but if your undergraduate GPA is, is not up to par, um, then, you know, then you need to have probably a better, a better MCAT, and we can discuss that um, individually. Um, with regard to the three seven, okay, so there are a lot of questions with regard to, well, how many people actually got the three seven? Of the people who are waitlisted, how many people got the three seven? Of the people who are not waitlisted, how many people got the three seven? And I don't have that aggregate data all in front of me. So this is, this is what I'm gonna tell you. So, the 3-7, yes, it's the 3-7. Number one, um, it's not curved. So you're not competing with um, the other people in your class. So if everybody gets a 3-7, great. Um, it probably won't happen, but you're not competing. You're not competing. So it's not like there's only a certain, I know in some undergraduate courses, they only give a certain number of A's and a certain number of A minuses. It's not like that at all. If everybody meets what we think are the standards, then that's what you get. Um, and those, you know, those are the grades that you get. So that's number one. So there is no competition. Everybody should be working together, number one. Number two, yes, the three seven gives you the guarantee, either the interview or the acceptance if you were waitlisted. However, we have a significant number of GCP students that do not meet the three seven that we recommend to our Office of Admission at FIU that they be interviewed and then they can be accepted. So they could be re-interviewed even though they were interviewed the first time. So someone had asked about, you know, how many people in this last cohort were, um, were waitlisted and how many people waitlisted to the MD program and how many people got into FIU. So actually the answer is that there were 18 people in our, um, our GCP program in this last cohort and 14 of them got accepted. Now, not all of them had a 3-7. Some of them were re-interviewed and then they were accepted. And we still have a couple of, of people who are on our MD waitlist. So, um, so hopefully that should um, make you feel a little bit better that it doesn't have to be exactly a 3-7 or game over because, because the game is not over. Um, just do as, as well as you can in the program, and we can recommend to admissions other people to, um, to interview. Um, there was a question then about what happens if you're invited to other medical schools to interview during the program. We hope that you will be invited to other medical schools to interview during the program as well. And we have a mechanism of excused absences. With documentation, you will be excused from the mandatory attendance, you will be excused from a quiz if there was a quiz that day. So I hope whoever asked that question, that answers that. Um, uh, somebody had asked about the faculty-student ratio. Um, actually, if you look at 
the number of faculty that was on the PowerPoint, there were 14 little circles there. And we usually have a cohort of about 50. So I think that's a pretty good ratio, right? That's um, a little bit less than, than three faculty, uh, three students for every faculty member. Um, so there really should not be a shortage of people you can go to ask questions of. Um, let me see, the graduation rate. Um, so one thing that you should know is, um, you, well, you already know that the program is, is a rigorous program. It may not be for everybody. Some people choose not to continue between the first semester and the second semester for various reasons. It could be because um, you know, of personal, personal things. Maybe they have to work and they find that the program is not, um, does not go along with having to work a full or part-time job. Um, sometimes people get accepted to medical school um, in the fall and then they don't come back in the spring. Um, there's various reasons why, why people realize that maybe this program is not for them. Um, so sometimes finances are an issue. Um, you right. get accepted and think you can make it work financially, but then financial, right. you know, your loans don't come through or there's a turn in the exchange rate <laughs> in Argentina. Right. Yeah, we had that as well. Right. Was it Argentina or was it Venezuela? Or what? I don't know. But in any case, um, yeah. So, um, so I would say of the people who, who take both semesters, um, you know, and again, I don't really have the aggregate data, but I would say it's between 85 and 90 percent of the students who, who complete um, the program um, graduate with the certificate. Um, in order to get the certificate, one must maintain a 3.0 uh, GPA um, for both semesters. That being said, though, we do have students, and I just received a really great email from a student who was uh, um, in cohort two, who is now just about to, um, he's, he's finishing up second year, and he did not earn the certificate, but is now, um, you know, in medical school and completing second year. Um, he's uh, He's been tutoring his, um, the lower classmen of his medical school. And so, and I said to him, I can't count how many times, do not give up. It is not over until it's over. And you make that decision as to when it's over. And mm -hmm. he chose to make it all the way into medical school. Mm -hmm. Right, so, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of paths and there's a lot of things, even if one does not get the certificate, um, just the skills, um, not only the biomedical knowledge, but the skills that, that you, will, you will obtain will be valuable no matter, no matter where you're going. Um, yes, another question was, how many HW come um, CCP students are there now in each class? Um, it's varied, actually between 12 and what, 16? Yeah, in, I think 15 and 20. Probably. 15? Yeah, 20. Yeah, something like that because we have, there's 120 MD students and every year it has always exceeded 10% of the entering class. Um, uh, some students who get accepted to HWCOM <clears throat> choose to go elsewhere, um, but that's not because they weren't accepted. Um, but again, for personal reasons, other things, usually it's finance or relationships, like boyfriends girlfriends, um, people decide to go uh, to, other, to other medical schools, or maybe sometimes it's simply to get out of Miami if they've been in Miami their entire life. So, um, so yeah, but it's at least 10% of every class and usually more like 15% of every MD class uh, consists of GCP students. In fact, what we have heard from uh, the faculty who teach the first year is when they break up the students into small groups, they make sure that there's not more than one or at the most two GCP students in each of the small groups, because otherwise it's not fair to the other students. Um, so just kind of an aside. Um, let me see, were there any other questions? Um, let's see. Uh, do waitlisted applicants write up a new personal statement as well as reconnect with science faculty letter writers as we apply to the GCP program. 
Um, unfortunately, just um, even if you've been waitlisted or applied before to FIU, uh, HWCOM, um, our application is totally separate from the AMCAS application. Um, you don't really have to write a new personal statement, just modify it because as I mentioned before, the personal statement is really why you wanna to go to medical school, which is what you should have written, but also why you want GCP. So just add a few sentences at the end about why you want the GCP program. Um, you will have to ask the faculty um, to, they could send their same letter to medical school. It doesn't have to be customized for GCP, but if they already wrote a letter for medical school, they can, um, they can upload the very same letter. When you submit the application, the, um, the departmental application, that's when your letter writers will get an email uh, request to, to upload their letter with directions of how to upload the letter. If you have a committee packet, like FIU um, has a pre-health office that makes a committee packet, then if any of you are from FIU, Dr. Lichter knows very well, you can just, ink, you could just put him down. You don't have to put two email addresses. Just put Dr. Lichter's email address and he will, he can upload the very same packet um, to the, the departmental application for GCP. So I hope that answered that. Um, yeah, oh, this is a really good one. Thank you, Chris. Are there any other, any contingency plans if the fall semester is online due to the virus? And what can you look for housing or is this to be determined? or when? Um, very good question. And that's something that we're, we're, we, we meet. Well, we meet three times a week anyway, um, but we meet with the president, we meet with the provost. Um, right now, FIU is on remote learning until July 31st. Um, so we don't know, um, but I think we should be able, we, we, should be, we should be fine in the GCP program. Um, on March 12th of this year, we were informed at 12 noon that as of that moment, <laughs> we, would, we would be doing remote learning. Um, we had we converted all the courses uh, to Zoom or um, as was previously mentioned, everything is video captured. So we had the videos from the last time that same lecture was given. And then by Zoom had Q and A um, for anybody that, um, you know, for the class to go over problems and things of that sort based on the lecture. Um, so we're actually pretty well equipped after having done it since March 12th um, to Zoom with you, to do small groups with you. We even, we've had group presentations um, by Zoom. We've done everything um, pretty much by Zoom the last half of, the, of this semester. And so, um, so we would be fine if the, <clears throat> if the fall semester starts online. Um, when you should look for housing? Um, that's a good question. That is a good question. Would anybody like to weigh in on when to look for housing? We're, we're assuming it's going to be face to face. Um, yeah, so until FIU releases something official uh, about the plans for for fall semester, if it'll be um, if, if there will be any portion of it remotely, we're assuming it will be face to face. Exactly. Um, I know what they're doing in some classes is they're, um, they're going to have, for example, half the class on Zoom, half the class face-to-face. -face. If, if it happens to be a really large class, we don't have a problem. Our classes, um, nobody asked about the class size. Maybe, do they want to know about the class size? I think somebody asked, but I think one of our alumni, um, one of our alumni answered it. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. Um, so, because the class size... We don't want to have more than 60 people um, in this program because we feel with all the personalized um, things that we do with the mandatory advising, mandatory attendance, mandatory lots of things, um, and a lot of assignments and things like that in small group, we think that 60 maximum is a good number. So I don't think we'd have a problem because our auditoriums are sufficiently large that we can be spacing um, people. So are we going to be able to rewatch this webinar later? Yes, um, it's being recorded. We will get the link and somehow send it. How will we for those who would want to rewatch it, um, we can please email biomedsert at fiu.edu and we can share the link. Great idea. 
Yeah, because I don't I don't have a list right right here of your email addresses or anything. I just see names um, coming up. So uh, the average GPA and MCAT scores of accepted students into GCP. Well, since we do have students who, um, well, first of all, not everybody's in the MCAT when they apply to GCP number one. And number two, we do have a number of students who for whatever reason did not get into medical school. So the average GPA and MCATs scores are, are lower than they are for the, the rest of the, um, the entering class to FIU. I don't know exactly what the, you know, what they, what they are in aggregate because now we've done it four times but they are lower um, than for the entering class um, who has not been in GCP. Uh, let's see, what other, what other questions? What percentage of students achieve the three seven threshold? That varies semester to semester. I would say no more than, probably no more than 25 to 30% in any cohort actually get the three seven. But like I said, you don't have to concentrate so much on the three seven because at least with our admissions uh, committee, they are willing to, um, they know uh, the product that we're putting out. And so even if a student has a three five or a three six, um, they can get a guaranteed interview or if they had a, gar a guarantee for the, for the admissions because they were waitlisted, they can be re-interviewed and then they can get accepted by account. So I hope Just that a clarification helps. there. Um, if you have a three, four, three, five, three, six GPA, there is no guarantee, but um, then you are, uh, we, we as the um, Graduate Certificate Program Committee will write letters of reference on your behalf and um, share that with the um, HWCOM Admissions Committee and um, we recommend um, those, you know, students with GPAs of that sort um, for interview and just to be in the regular scheduled um, um, interview cycle and admission cycle. Uh, one of the other things to keep in mind is, and it's, I would say, probably everybody thinks it's very nerve wracking, but um, GCP students are in the very last um, admissions um, meetings um, and, and the um, interview cycle. So they're, you know, after week five of spring semester, so the beginning of February is when this, um, you know, if you are a part of the um, admission cycle for class of 2025, you would be interviewed in February of 2025. Dr. Dr. Weiler, uh, can I say something about um, the letters of rec? Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like letters of recommendation from the GCP faculty is very important if you want to apply to FIU, because this is an opportunity to really show that you belong in that environment. Um, if you know, if, if you're, if you treat this program as just like any other regular program, like, oh, I'm just going to go to class Tuesday, Thursday, go there at one and leave and not interact with anybody, not talk to the professors, not show that you care and that you want to be there by, you know, and then like throw the little extra sprinkle there and volunteer and uh, be part of the committee and all that kind of stuff. If you don't do any of that, then you know, your letter of recommendation might not be as strong as you want it to be. Um, so really take the opportunity not to show academically to FIU specifically that you belong there, that you're smart enough, but that also you align with your mission statement and their values of uh, community and family and support. And that's extremely important. Thank you. I um, can I add something to you real quick? Sorry. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to like kind of give a little testament to the GPA as well. So while the 3.7, you know, is like a golden ticket into FIU, for me personally, I was nowhere near the 3.7, not even close to a 3.5. But for me, and I'm not, I'm not going to FIU, I'm going to a school in New Mexico. So 
the other thing I want to keep, keep in mind is that this program helps you get into schools, not only FIU, but also other medical schools as well. And during my interviews and my secondary applications, the testimony that I gave about my experiences in GCP is, the, or what I believe is the reason why I got into medical school. Proving to these schools that, okay, I've had a taste of what it's like. I've dealt with the, the volume. I've dealt with the, you know, the material and I was able to over those challenges and rise above it. That's what helped get me into medical school. And like I said, the, I also didn't apply to, um, I, to other, I only applied to basically only DO school. So for me, that was my path and GCP still helped me get there. So yes, the three, seven is really important to strive for that. But at the end of the day, we, um, it's not something that you should like solely focus on because there are other opportunities out there, even if you don't reach that three, seven. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I see other questions. What percentage, these are, these are tricky percentage of what? Um, because the percentage of people who applied percentage of people, um, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. It also depends on the cohort. Um, the how many students out of each class make the three seven also what is the average GPA for the graduating class of GCP I think it varies also um, I would say what Dr. Weller it's around a three three probably probably yeah something like a three three mm -hmm. students who complete the second semester um, what percentage of students who complete the GCP program and were not previously waitlisted are accepted well, that, that also depends. Um, you know, um, at FIU, it's a holistic review. So I can tell you that even if you end up with a huge MCAT score and, and a great GBA, but you have no clinical experience, you have no community service, you have no leadership, um, you know, you have no research, you have no, you know, other enriching factors, those are all the things that um, the that, that committee will look at um, so it very, very much depends um, on, I mean, I was talking to somebody with a 4.0 GBA, but doesn't have, and a good MCAT, but doesn't have anything else. And I said, you know what, don't apply this year because you're not going to, you're not going to get in. Um, but if you have nothing else, um, no clinical experience, no community service, no leadership, like, you know, and he's applying between junior and senior year, take a senior year and, and do those things and then apply. So it's very much a holistic review. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer those questions. I'd be, you know, I'd be happy to, to um, talk with you um, individually. Those of you who have the, you know, who are so focused on the percentage, I mean, it's 100% for you if you get in, right? I mean, that's the important thing. What, what's the difference if the whole cohort doesn't, you know, what the percentage of the whole cohort? You know, you have to, you have to do what you need to do in order to get in, right? Um, um, she sounds a little bit evasive there, but it's really reality. I mean, we have, um, we have very good GCP alumni who keep in touch with us um, quite well, but there are some students that are, you know, alumni that are lost to follow up. And so we don't know where they ended up. We don't know what they're doing and they could be in medical school. They could not. Um, another thing, you know, if um, we say that, I don't know, um, um, say 25% of the people that entered the class actually are in medical school, but that doesn't take into account the fact that only 25% of the class applied, right? And so really of the people that applied, lots got in, right? And so mm -hmm. there's all kinds of caveats here and there that we need to take into account. Um, you know, as we're, as we're coming up with those numbers. And the other thing is this, um, you know, we've got students who are getting, applying for medical school while they are in GCP. There are students who are applying to medical school after they get out of GCP. Um, there are students who really say, you know what, medical school really isn't for me and I'm gonna do a healthcare MBA. I'm gonna do an MPH, I'm gonna do research or whatever. And we consider that to be a success as well, right? We want you to really realize where your passions lie and um, help you get there. 
Um, so there's a lot that goes behind those statistics. Yeah, there's an interesting question. How clear are the standards for professionalism? Have you witnessed anyone having issues with reaching this requirement? Um, yes, actually, <laughs> the, stand the standards are very clear. Um, you will see, uh, we, use, we use Canvas as a, as a platform for our learning management system. You will see the, you will see the criteria and, and yes, um, in fact, in our, in our first year, it was, it was kind of interesting. So there was one young man who, he sat in the front, he would wear a ratty t-shirt and he'd wear basketball shorts and ratty sneakers. And we have, we asked our students to dress professionally. Um, and, and so when he met with me, I said to him, this is not, this is, this is not professional. If you don't dress professionally, you're not going to act professionally. And I said, you know, you're going to get dinged on the professionalism evaluation because your, <clears throat> your behavior is such that you talk out of turn, you know, you're not dressed properly and, and this is not, this is not professional. Well, the next week and Dr. Weller can bear me, bear it out. He comes to see me. He's wearing a sports shirt and tie and like dress pants. And I said, well, you know, you really went the other way. And he said, well, I didn't have anything in between. These are actually my dad's clothes and we're the same size. <laughs> so from then on, the entire semester, he actually wore a sports shirt and dress socks, not always a tie. And, and he tempered how he was talking out of, out of turn all the time. And so, oh yes, that would have been somebody. I mean, we were delighted with the turnaround. <laughs> yeah. We, we have, um, we have had, uh, you know, we, we, we solicit feedback from our faculty about each student as it relates to professionalism. And um, we, we provide that feedback to students if we consider it to be, um, well, for the vast majority of students, people meet expectations because we're very clear about what those expectations are. And you know, when they don't meet our expectations, we let them know exactly what it is that um, they didn't, you know, why they didn't meet our expectations and we do what we can to help them get there. Um, and, you know, I would say that we have had nobody that has not met our expectations by the end of the year. And that's what I mean about the coaching atmosphere. You are not judged in this program. You are um, guided. Uh, we identify areas for improvement, and then we, you know, help mm -hmm. support you in your development. Mm -hmm. And I would say that all of our um, our our medical school faculty are delighted um, with our GCP alumni, mm -hmm. and. Everyone says, oh, they're such great people and they are always so well behaved and so kind and so supportive and so on and so forth. So um, I think it's a testament to the, the type of professionalism, coaching and stuff that we provide. So we have our last question that came in are for the program alumni that are still with us. If you only had one word to describe your main takeaway, most valuable lesson from GCP, what would it be? And I know Caesar and Lewis have already uh, answered on the Q and A, but I don't know if anybody wants to also add. Tough question. Nobody? That's a very tough question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a tough question to I guess my one word to describe GCP would be rewarding, because you have to. It's one of those things. It's one of those you know opportunities where you our face, especially my cohort, we had a lot of challenges and every curveball that was thrown your way, you just you had to figure it out. And it was a struggle at first, but then you learned how to manage and you kind of, it's you push yourself to a, a new goal and a new standard that you didn't think you could reach before. And so for me, that was, that was rewarding. And to see, okay, now I can go into medical school. I can handle different things being thrown at me and different changes. Like, COVID-19, for example, I can hit, I can handle it now. I've, you know, GCP, like what, throw it at me. What else you got, you know? For me, I guess I would say that 
a word that would describe GCP would be beneficial. Like everything that I've learned, whether it be the content, would come back somehow in the future to help me. Not just that, but also the other skills like for how to be professional, how to do, how to be a leader, how to work in groups, all those things, all those skills that you learn along the way, in addition to the content, works out perfectly for first year, second year, even in third year, I'm sure it'll show up as soon as we go to the clinics and have to work in groups and work with attendings with people we don't like, you know, all those, all those soft skills come to come into play as well. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Yeah, I would say probably exciting because you're kind of already getting your foot in the door into what you want to see and what you want to do in the future in terms of, you know, being within a cohort, taking classes that are of a much higher difficulty level, and finally, like, studying to that high of a degree, something that you're going to see way later on, too. So it's, it's just, it's exciting. It's exciting, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. And also for, I guess, for those who haven't seen the Q&A, um, Caesar answered um, learning to learn and Lewis answered teamwork because um, you can't do anything without teamwork between students and faculty. Um, and I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything else. Oh, we have some more questions. Oh, no, we don't. No more questions. Well, if we're done with our Q&A section, um, thanks for joining us. If you have any further questions, um, you can check out the website. Andrea created a short link here. So go.fiu.edu slash GCPNBS. That's Graduate Certificate Program Molecular and Biomedical Science. Or you can email us at biomedcert at fiu.edu. And um, you should be able to find the information you need there. Right, and somebody will always answer BioMedSart um, if you have any any questions, or if you you know if you want to contact me um, directly, my uh, especially about admissions questions to medical school or to the GCP program. Um, my email is rollerb. R O L L E R B at FIU dot EDO. Very simple because my. What happened? I just stopped the share. Oh, That's all. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, anyway, um, we thank you all for uh, for coming. I see there's still. 24 people, so there must be some potential um, applicants or students that are on it in addition to, to those of us. So we thank you. And if you have any, any further questions, um, particularly about the, you know, about anything with regard to the program, but particularly about the application process, um, I'm not sure if anybody answered because the question went away. How soon after you complete your application? Um, will you be notified? You'll be notified when, once, as soon as your, your application is totally complete, um, we will review it. You'll see your status will change to, um, to under review. And then once it's reviewed, it will be preliminary review complete. And then the status based on the admissions people, um, uh, putting a numerical score as well as comments on your application, um, you'll then get um, a status um, either accept, waitlist, or, or not accept. And so, of course, we hope that, um, that those of you uh, who have been joining us uh, find that this is something you want to apply for, and you also, this will be something that will be helpful to you and that um, it, it can make a difference for you and that you have the, the credentials in order to be successful in this program. So, um, so as soon as you get all your, all your application material together, uh, on university graduate school application with transcript and the departmental application with two letters of recommendation, then your application can be reviewed. Is there anything, anything else, anything else coming up? 
The only other comment I was going to say is that this application to GCP is completely independent of what's happening with the medical school. And right. you can, um, while you were on the wait list for medical school, you can apply to GCP. And if you end up getting accepted into medical school at FIU or anywhere else for that matter, you can um, simply let us know that you are have alternative plans and we will um, you know um, remove your application from our our pool exactly okay well thank you so much for joining us we appreciate all the panelists helping out and yeah. Um, if you have any questions, you know where to find us. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Good thank night. you all. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. Bye. Stay safe. You too.